I was originally I worked as a uh, on memory from a theoretical perspective in the 1950s and early 1960s um, and I ran a seminar with a man called Gus Craig who is now at the University of Toronto uh, who is well known for um, um, theory called levels of processing um, on memory and to this to this seminar that we ran um, a clinician called Elizabeth Warrington used to come along. One day in the pub after we'd had the seminar, she was chatting to me. She said she had a sort of patient uh, who had a, a normal long-term memory and a completely inadequate short-term memory. I was a disciple of a Canadian uh, theorist called Hebb, who had argued that information was retained over short intervals of time in neural circuitry by reverberating circuits, continuing activity in the same set of neurons or the same network of neurons. And this laid down the trace in long-term memory. So I said to Elizabeth, you obviously got it wrong. She said, you better come and see the patient. So I went to see the patient. She was right and I was wrong. This patient had a completely normal long-term memory, but his short-term memory was shot to pieces in certain domains. So I then moved from being a lecturer here at University College to working as a researcher in the National Hospital across the square from where we are now. Um, and I worked extensively on the problems that patients had and how they could uh, inform our understanding of the normal brain mind. And at that time, the purely behavioral methods of, of cognitive psychology were rather weak and very difficult to uh, reject a plausible theory using them. But patients have these dramatic dissociations between different types of uh, abilities. For instance, we work with patients who could recognize uh, and know what all sorts of man-made objects were, such as a, tra a tractor or a fork, uh, but they had no idea what was specific about, say, a lion or an apple. They knew the lamb was an animal, they knew was, that apple was a fruit, but they knew nothing more about it. On the other hand, as an obscure object as a tractor, they'd know and tell you what it did. Uh, so this, this sort of information indicated that the brain was organised rather differently from the way that many theorists had assumed just based on behaviour at all. And it indicated to me that information about the brain, in my case, through looking at patients or working with patients who would have unfortunate damage to the brain, could be very informative about how the normal mind operated. Um, and I then worked in Cambridge for a period, and then came back to University College, and then the then uh, provost, Derek Roberts, invited me to set up a new institute, the Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience, where we are now. Uh, for a variety of reasons. And one was this method that we'd used of looking at patients was becoming only one of the ways by which information about the brain could inform information about how the mind is organized. Uh, for instance, there's functional imaging, transcranial magnetic res uh, stimulation, uh, MEG, all sorts of methods have now become available so that the, and they constrain how the mind they provide very valuable information about how the mind could be organized just as a machine independently almost of the brain. Uh, so the idea of setting up the Institute was to bring together many different aspects of University College. We use different types of methods um, and because the combination of methods was proving much more powerful than any one by itself. Well, um, by half good planning and half fortuitous, th this particular location has enormous facilities for, available for this type of research. For instance, when we were just setting up the Institute, Richard Fakoviak had set up the functional imaging lab just down the road from here, about three or four houses away, uh, which was by far the most powerful uh, 
a research institute using functional imaging, the most powerful of the cognitive neuroscience methods available. And this was the most powerful institute in the world in this area. Across the square, 50 yards away, there's the main neurological hospital in Britain, and I'm still very much concerned with working, what you can learn from working with patients. And we have specialists on all the other types of methodology as well, all within a sort of 50 to 100 yards radius. So it's, it's a terrific place to do this sort of research. It was, as far as I know, I don't know of any other center or institute for cognitive neuroscience that was set up anywhere else in the world before the ICN. That may be wrong, but I have not, not looked into the history of it. There certainly were not many around. And as I said, we had here, across UCL, an enormous capacity of, or no, a number of very strong people working in a variety of different areas. So it seemed an extremely uh, attractive opportunity. At the same time, bureaucratically, the way that the college ran at that time was each department was very separate from each other department. So it was very, it was almost a resistance to collaboration across departments. And the few people of whom Roberts was one, Lakoviak were another, uh, were very keen to break this isolation of individual departments to form collaborative links. So that there was, from the top, there was a lot of support for creating cross-departmental interactions, which this institute is an example of. In some departments, there was more resistance to it uh, at the time, but now I think it's generally accepted that this type of interaction uh, is necessary. So it was Bureaucratically, it was quite a challenge, but intellectually, it was a very uh, attractive opportunity. 